I, uh, I was born and, and grew up in Richmond, Virginia, uh, which was, of course, the capital of the Confederacy, so a very southern place. Um, but we did have a really wonderful uh, art museum there, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And by the time I was about 10 years old, um, I had long discovered that they had a small but really good Egyptian collection, which was actually put together uh, largely by Bernard Bothmer. Um, and I, uh, I used to visit the museum regularly, and um, I, I've said many times that my sister and I would always go and she would head straight to the Fabergé eggs and I would head straight to the Egyptian stuff. Um, so I think like many Egyptologists, um, I got hooked on Egypt as a child. And um, I've often said that I ended up as an Egyptologist because I didn't have any more imagination than that. <laughs>
and then of course after my coursework finished um, and Charlie was done with law school we actually moved to New York so after that I actually commuted to New Haven uh, instead of the other way around um, but it was really coming from my own interest that I was material culture and language were both things that I really saw that worked together and at that time anybody who did really art history did almost did no language and that to me seemed awfully odd and um, so when I wrote my dissertation it's very well reflected in there that it, both interests are always in there and so it's a, there's a lot of visual and there's a lot of text and it, to me it was utterly natural but it was funny because the art historians sort of treated me like I wasn't one of them because I would always bring up the text <laughs> um, and and people who were really true philologists you know they're they didn't think you needed to mess with any of these pictures. So, um, but of course, all of that has changed drastically um, in the 50 years since I first got my, uh, started studying. My professor, my advisor was Kelly Simpson um, at Yale. And he was a person that, you know, many people have different views about. Um, I was never, close to Kelly, um, but he was always there, you know, I mean, in the background, he, he was so supportive, and one of the things about him that was very special that um, a lot of people don't realize is that he was all, he always backed his students, but he never let them know. And so I heard many, many times of when I was, for example, doing dissertation uh, research and traveling in Europe and elsewhere, people shared with me that he had been in touch with them to ask them, you know, to help me. He never told me that, you know. And so I ended up having an enormous um, uh, 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 admiration and fondness um, for Kelly over um, after. Um, after having been his student. Um, and I also took from that for myself that a professor doesn't need to be a student's friend. And I think Jazz now and I, um, who have been together for so many years teaching, that's the way we are too, is that students need mentors. And they need people who um, are aware of their situation and will do something to help them, but they don't need a buddy. They've got people their own age who are their buddies. And unfortunately, I've seen too many very unfortunate kind of overreaching between faculty um, to students that ended badly for everybody and it's just not necessary. So I've also admired that part um, about Kelly. Um, and Bothmer, Bernard Bothmer was a fabulous teacher um, and also very friendly. Um, but I, I got to know him more after I'd finished my coursework and I was using the Wilbur Library as the setting for writing my dissertation. And I actually became quite, um, quite close to him in, uh, in that situation. But I would never have wanted to work for him. I mean, the people who worked for him were miserable. <laughs>
and, uh, and Redford was very happy to do it. And ultimately it was really good for me because Dawn then, after we got to know each other, agreed to be one of the readers on my dissertation and that was a, a big help um, to me. But um, I, uh, I, you know, I did actually agree to go and then got pregnant um, and unexpectedly got pregnant, but I wanted to go so bad I really did not tell him, which was not a good thing to do, but it's what I did anyway. So I showed up um, with five months pregnant, um, and he was so nice about it. I, I, I'm not sure I would have been anything like as nice as he was to me. Um, so he, you know, he said, that's okay, you can be the photographer and the registrar and, you know, mostly stay at the house. And I said, okay, fine, you know. Um, and it was, um, you know, it was a easy way to get into, um, to doing something with archaeology. Um, you know, Redford is a, uh, Redford is a, a, I don't know superhuman kind of personality and um, the fact that he's still going strong at 88 is you know really remarkable to me but um, it, it was it, it was really interesting to work with him because what I loved about him is every single day whether you were in the trench or you were doing what I was doing on that first time um, he came and spoke to everybody and sort of updated you on his understanding of where we were with the excavation and what was going on. And it was coming out of his own passion and excitement for the work, but it, it also really made everybody feel that they were a part um, of what was going on. I finished my, uh, um, my doctorate in 1980 and kind of sat around um, for a fairly long time because there just weren't jobs. I applied for a lot of things and, you know, didn't get them. So I was an adjunct at several places during that period. Um, but then um, in 1985, Ariel Kozlov reached out to me to say that she was thinking of doing an exhibition on Amenhotep III and would I be interested in joining her. And I, I loved the idea. Um, and then at the exact same time, um, the Alexander Badawi position um, was created at, uh, at Hopkins. Um, and so I was applying for that as well. Um, and ultimately, I got that job, but <clears throat> I decided to take it and also work um, on the exhibition. But originally I would have moved to Cleveland for the duration, um, but instead they, um, they worked out a fabulous deal that Continental Airways donated to the museum um, airfares for me to fly back and forth. So every week for several years, um, I flew out f four days of the week I was in Cleveland and three days I was in Baltimore. And, um, and it, was, um, it, it was hard to do, but it obviously paid off uh, very, very well for, for uh, research-wise as well as for the exhibition. So, um, that was a wonderful experience and working with um, Ariel and she was so kind. She, I stayed with her and Jerry. Um, they had a huge house. And, um, and then Larry Berman joined us very early on. Um, and um, I spent a lot of time with Larry when I was, uh, when I was out there. Um, so it was, really the best of all possible experiences you could have working with a museum. Cleveland was so generous at um, supporting our traveling everywhere we want, ever wanted to go. Um, and um, 
for pure research purposes. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it happens anymore. Um, so I, I mean, I was, I was very lucky to have been involved in that and um, I became good friends with a whole lot of people in museums in Europe and elsewhere as, uh, as a result. Um, and, you know, we did finally get loans from Egypt. It was not easy. We were supposed to get 10 pieces and ultimately we only got three uh, for a million dollars. Um, but, um, but that was Amenhotep, son of Hapu. Um, so you know, nothing to sneeze at, plus that gargantuan red granite head of Amenhotep III from the Luxor Museum. Um, so uh, it, was, it really was a great experience. We, early on in, in trying to plan how we would go about doing this, um, uh, this exhibition, um, we decided that we really, where we needed to go, we made lists of museums. Um, as, as often as we could, Ariel and I would go together because that way we would actually have a chance to discuss things. But as time went on, it became more and more common that she would go to one set of places and I would go to another one. Um, but we also, from the beginning, um, counted in that we really needed to have a, a conference and uh, bring together people who were already working on this topic um, and had specific ideas. And so we planned um, uh, this conference that took place in 1987, um, which was only a little more than a year after we had started working. and. Um, and, and really was terrific. Um, Bernard Bothmer, um, Claude Vanderslan, Christina Strauss-Zaber, um, Ray Johnson, it was the first time Ray had ever uh, talked about, um, uh, about this material. Um, and um, uh, I forget, there were so many people that, uh, that I'm embarrassed to forget, but they really are. And it was we pub it was published, and Larry, in fact, um, edited that book. Um, but one of the things I remember the most about it, uh, that whole period, was Larry um, had to deal with Bothmer um, in terms of getting the publication done, and um, and and he, Bothmer was never happy with anybody editing anything he did, right? So he submitted his, um, uh, his, um, his paper, which I remember was called Eyes and Iconography. And, um, and Larry sent it back, you know, after they had uh, done some light uh, work on it. And Bothmer sent him back a 39-numbered 39 letter that went on for like 15 pages that listed everything that wrong with what his editing was. But the funniest one of all was somewhere in the middle of it all, you know, there was one, a number, and next to it it said, I've forgotten what I was going to say, and then he goes on to the next number. <laughs> so, and then, but one of the most common things that he would write would be SEP. SEP, SEP, and none of us knew what SEP was until finally we realized it meant standard Egyptological procedure, <laughs> which apparently was Bernard's standard Egyptological procedure. <laughs> so, um, you know, so in any case, uh, Larry really, um, he, he put up with a great deal, but it, it turned out uh, um, all for the best. And then, you know, as we slowly were able to make a decision about which things we really had to have, um, and, then, um, and then began conversations directly with the museums um, over whether they would um, or wouldn't land. And of course, almost all of them really came across with wonderful um, material. I think everybody liked the idea, all the museums liked the idea of participating in this. And um, Harry James um, was so kind to s give us one of the Solep lions and uh, he told me that uh, he said that he was 
walking past it one day in the in his galleries before it left and he said he was pretty sure he saw it lift a paw to give him a wave. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it, yeah, it it's hard to, you know, when I think back about it, I, I really do miss those days. There was so much comradeship and there was so much good stuff. Um, you know, that it, that, uh, you don't get that kind of thing very often. So I was, um, you know, I really did want to start a project that I could get students um, involved with. And um, so right after um, the um, exhibition, was done and opened, um, I decided that I wanted to uh, to work in a tomb, but uh, but specifically with the idea that I wanted to continue working on, um, on art production, but switch from statuary to painting, and it seemed like I had visited a bunch of tombs for another project a few years before and one of them stood out to me and it was a, a, a an unfinished painted tomb um, and unfinished in so many different ways that it was really an opportunity to sort of explore the techniques that they were using to do this work and so that's what I decided I really wanted to uh, to, to do as a project, and that was the tomb of the royal butler, Suim Newitt. And uh, so we worked there from uh, 93 to 2001. I still haven't published it, although I've published so much in terms of uh, articles and photographs that, you know, I'm not sure how much more there is to say, but one of these days I will wander back to it. But it really did um, uh, give a lot of students their, their opportunity to, to learn on the job um, some techniques. And it was Carol got cut her teeth uh, at, at that tombs. And um, JJ um, and pretty much all of my older students um, started there. Um, and Nozomu came, Kawai came to, um, to, to us um, during that time period. Now he was one who had way more experience than, uh, than pretty much any of the students. So he was a boon to have um, and was able to teach other students a, a lot as well. Um, so that, I mean, that was a, a, a really great place. It's, Working in Gorna is not at all like working on the east side of the river, which I can say now. Um, I still miss working on the West Bank, but I have to say that um, it, it's, it, it can be a tough area working with the, uh, the local Gurnawi who didn't always seem to want to have you there. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I ended up in a lot of arguments every season about who was going to work for us because I was using people from Byrock because um, they were friends of mine already. And that really annoyed the Gurnawi who wanted us to hire their people and their families. And then, of course, the inspectors always had many, many relatives that um, were interested. Um, so I had some of the tensest moments, really, of my uh, working on the site career, just those arguments about who's going to get hired, you know. And, but, you know, but anyway, I, I, I remember one time I was going to have to confront a couple of people, and I practiced my Arabic speech in front of the mirror for, <laughs> for like 30 minutes to make sure I could say it <laughs> and mean it. <laughs> you know, when we were finishing up um, with uh, Suim Newitt, I really by that time realized that um, I needed a larger place 
to work um, that would accommodate more students um, if they wanted to do dissertations, etc. Um, and so I started visiting lots of sites and um, and I, you know, I saw lots of things that I thought were possible. I actually talked um, with Dieter Arnold at one point about doing the Mastabas um, up by Dashur area. Um, and, um, but ultimately Richard Fazzini contacted me and asked if I would be interested in uh, sharing the Moot Precinct. And, um, of course, in typical Richard fashion, he said, because I'm not going to work there anymore after next year. Right? So I said, no, it's like, how long ago? That was 20-some years ago now. Um, but, um, you know, so I said, well, why don't we try it? I'll come on your concession ticket and bring a team and if, if it gets approved. And then if it works out, we'll, you know, we'll go from there. And so our first season, we were actually there as part of their, um, their concession. And, um, you know, it, it, it really did work fine. The, I think that there was so, there's so much to do at the Moot Temple um, that you're always going to be able to provide students with uh, something that will interest them if they want to pursue it on their own. Um, I'm still not a temple person after all this time. Um, I really miss working in a tomb, but I think it was certainly the right choice. And I can't complain at all about what we've learned and discovered because it's, it's always been an unexpected place to work. Um, not only inside the temple, but in the area behind where we really did have, you know, typical sort of temple uh, installations for support but then all of a sudden you know we find these uh, burials and uh, unexpectedly uh, a form of a cemetery and nobody would expect to have in, in that environment and um, all sorts of very interesting um, uh, buildings that some of which functionally I'm still not sure of but um, it's it's always provided um, you know something unexpected and uh, uh, keep your interest up. Yeah. So you know the American Research Center in Egypt is the organization that represents us, um, we Americans who do history, any kind of research on Egypt, um, in Egypt. And um, I got involved with RC the way anybody does by going to meetings and stuff. But my first real encounter with being more involved in that um, was in the period when I finished my di doctorate, but I didn't have a job and I was adjuncting. So <clears throat> I started to um, uh, help out by taking care of making the editing and creating the newsletter. Um, so I did that in, in New York City for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, and I got to know the organization. And then, you know, not long after that, I had an RC fellowship. And, um, and that really um, brought me closer into the uh, organization. That was in 1984. And I, I have found that I was, over the years, I spent a lot of time in Egypt and ended up probably knowing pretty much every director um, who, who lived in that odd flat <laughs> in, um, in Cairo. And, um, it, you know, it, be, it becomes a place and a thing that, um, is almost like a extended family and I think that um, especially in those earlier years um, when um, uh, you know when people would come to, to Egypt you needed to have uh, uh, that and you had Madame Amira after uh, Atiyah um, Habashi went on um, 
And these are these became people who were like part of your family. So for me, it wasn't um, too surprising that once I was I had a teaching position and I was running a project, um, I, I was I became a member of the board because. Um, Hopkins was a research supporting member, and um, in those days, you every research supporting member got uh, a board member, um, and so you end up becoming more and more part of that organization. So, <clears throat> I mean, I think there are many things I could say about um, the American Research Center in Egypt. It's a uh, it, it's an organization that. It is very disparate, and it it may not be particularly. I think oftentimes it's a dysfunctional organization. It partly because it runs on two continents and not very much in sync. Um, but I think it has tried to grow with the times and. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, having been on the board and then actually been vice president and president, um, you know, you get a sort of very close look at the finances and how, how the management is working. And I would have to say that it's probably, in my view, um, working better than it has in a, uh, in a very long time. But nothing is guaranteed. You know, and um, I think the more people reach out to say what they want RC to do, the better it is. Yeah, I've been fortunate to, you know, to be at a um, in an actual Near Eastern Studies department now for you know, since 1986. And um, before that, when I taught at places like Marymount, Manhattan, or, you know, as an adjunct at Yale, I was teaching, you know, undergrad, sort of big history classes, that kind of thing. Um, but for me, you know, I've, the, the really good fortune of, of being at, uh, at Hopkins has, has been to train graduate students. And I love teaching undergrads, and I always do um, uh, do that. And um, I, I like even teaching big classes. But um, when you're able to attract really smart people, um, it allows you to step back and think about, you know, what do you what do you got to give them? And um, and I. I think I have do have a very specific um, philosophy uh, of teaching. I believe that that um, professors uh, don't visit their views um, on people in a in a demanding way. You share your views and what you think, but in the with the hope that you'll get the students to share what they think, and that I also believe that. Um, it is absolutely the case that students um, need need to be taught the basics. They need to understand uh, a visual grammar as much as a language grammar um, and a material culture grammar. And um, we we've been criticized inside the. Uh, by various and sundry reviewers um, uh, within our university that we demand too much coursework for our students. Um, and I've never, been in, um, uh, I've never been willing to let that shame us. And um, until very recently, we were still insisting on four full years of coursework. Um, you know, we finally had to reduce that uh, to three. But but we try to counteract it by taking students who've had some background before they come. Um, because, you know, it's, people really do want 
quickly now to start having an opinion about big issues in a field like Egyptology, especially things like colonialism or... Um, and I'm all in favor of people having those kinds of, uh, of conversations, um, but not in the absence of the basic knowledge of what they're talking about. And um, so I still believe that what's essential to teach is the language, the history, the art, and the archaeology in, in the most direct possible fashion. And then solicit from your students how they're going to use that stuff. I mean, and one, one method I use is in a seminar is I decide what articles I want to read, for example, on a topic, and I assign a student to every article um, so that I'm not talking about it, they're telling me about it. And their job is not only to read it, but to frame questions about those articles to their colleagues in the classroom. Um, so they have to become actually responsible for doing the teaching and figuring out what was important, why did, why did she want us to read this, right? Um, so I guess that kind of summarizes how I've gone about doing it. And, you know, a lot of it is luck too because we've just had such great students. <laughs>
and we were lucky, and they um, they they went for it. So, um, you know, Sanchita is a dynamo. Um, she's remarkable, and she's uh, maintained the the uh, the the museum. You know, it's not state of the art anymore, but you know, we're still keeping up with it as much as possible. And um, I, I was happy to say that um, I asked uh, if, if they could, I've been director since 2006 or something, and I said, I think Sanchita should be director of the museum. So now officially she is, and um, I'm now what they call the faculty program chair, <laughs> whatever that means. But, um, but it's, it's a great place to be and it, 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 every time we offer a class, they're oversubscribed. And that shows you that even these very, um, very science-oriented Hopkins undergrads um, want to come in there because our classes do intentionally combine teaching a humanities along with um, scientific analysis of the object. So it's Sanchita on one end and me on now, it's um, Mari Lees, um providing these two different kinds of approaches to wonderful uh, Egyptian material. So we've, um, we've really been fortunate um, with that museum. And of course we still have the uh, Eaton College Myers collection um, on loan, so on a 20 year loan. We still have it for another seven years. And that's really thanks to Margie Fisher. She got that going and really supported our being able to complete the loan. So it's been a uh, been really wonderful uh, thing to work with. You know, I have lots of uh, the Temple of Mood to publish, and I'm right now. I'm um, I'm just finishing up the pottery uh, volume and um, so I hope that that will be completed this year or at least soon thereafter um, and I'm starting to um, to work on publishing the rest of the uh, of the moot material we, we kind of got a little off sync I think because um, VLN, she just loves to excavate, right? So I said after 2016, I'm not digging anymore, you know, it's just going to be study and then publish. Um, but she couldn't manage that. So from she started again in 2018 and she's out there all the time. So I can't really get her attention on working with my stuff. So instead, I'm kind of putting together a group that's going to work with me. And, you know, I, I'll pull her in when I have to. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, I'm always working on something um, different, but for articles, but the publishing that is the thing I really have to get done and want to get done. Um, it, it's a little uh, overwhelming just because of the length of time that we've been working, but um, I think I have now enough people to, to, to get it out, get it done. I, you know, I'm I'm one of these people who blows hot and cold about the future of, uh, uh, of our discipline. And when I say that, I mean Egyptology about ancient Egypt as opposed to um, other aspects. And uh, I think the, um, uh, a few years ago, I was maybe less enthusiastic than I feel today. Um, but I'm more worried that we, the field is spread too thin and doesn't quite know how to identify itself anymore. And I, I see that here um, at this RC meeting and some of the panels don't make any sense to me. I don't really know what they are trying to accomplish. Um, I'm not certain. Um, 
myself, but again, you know, that's coming from an old person, you know, and all old people are supposed to complain that youth doesn't know what it's doing, right? So, you know, so I'll just sit back and watch. Um, so, and the only one that I really, you know, am on the hobby horse about is, is that don't go teaching, don't go telling people you're teaching them Egyptology if you're not really teaching them all the basic stuff. Um, and, um, you know, so that's about it.